So picking back up with Quran chapter 2 verse 51, uh, in the previous video I stopped off at Quran 250. So I'm an unbeliever in both <laughs> the Bible and the Quran, but I've never really read the Quran, so I wanted to read it with you here. Uh, and many of us maybe have never seen this before. I have a good idea of what it teaches, even though I haven't read it. Verse 51, And remember when we appointed forty knots for Moses, then you worshipped the calf in his absence, acting wrongfully. So we're just repeating the stories of Genesis and Exodus uh, from the Bible. So nothing new, no holy divine revelation from God, just retelling the Bible stories. Even when we still forgave you, so perhaps you would be grateful. So for some strange reason, the Islamic God is extremely sensitive about thinking that there is more than one God, but yet he refers to himself in the Quran as we. So, but we is actually me for some strange reason. It's, it's the plural of majesty, I guess. But you cannot believe in multiple gods in, in Islam. But yet, he calls himself we. And remember when we gave Moses the scripture, the decisive authority that perhaps you would be rightly guided. So talking to the Israelites for some reason, uh, because the Islamic people are not Israelites. But yet, he, the God of Islam is admitting that the God of the Israelites uh, gave them the scriptures. Because, you know, technically it's supposed to be the same God. Verse 54. And remember when Moses said to his people, O oh, my people, surely you have wronged yourself by worshiping the calf. So turn in repentance to your creator and execute the calf worshipers among yourself. Execute the calf worshipers among yourself. So... So instant execution for those who messed up, but yet Allah is most merciful and compassionate. I don't see any mercy or compassion in uh, immediate execution for calf worshiping. That is best for you in the sight of your creator. So it's best for you to be executed, I guess. Uh, it's best for other people to see that you get executed if you worship a calf. Then he accepted your repentance. He didn't, he didn't accept the dead people's repentance. Surely, well, so who there was not worshiping the golden calf? A lot of problems. Surely he is the acceptor of repentance, most merciful, except for the people that got executed. And remember when you said, O oh Moses, we will never believe you until we see Allah with our own eyes. So a thunderbolt struck you while you were looking on. So God struck them with lightning since they said, well, Moses, we think that uh, you're just making up this God that we haven't seen him. So God strikes them with a thunderbolt. That's a nice way to let people know that you're a good and merciful God, right? Strike them with a thunderbolt. Then we brought you back to life after your death. So not only did he strike them with a thunderbolt, he actually killed them. So God killed these people just to prove that he was real. And then he brought them back to life, which the Bible, this is not in the Bible. The Quran's making this part up. So that perhaps she would be grateful. So God killed him and brought him back to life just to prove that he existed. I think I could think of better ways to demonstrate my existence. In loving and kind and merciful ways if I wanted to be a merciful and kind God. Verse 57. And remember when we shaded you with clouds and sent down to you manna and quails? So we being the one and only God, not multiple gods. Saying, eat from the good things we have provided for you. The evildoers certainly did not wrong us, but wronged themselves. So you can't hurt God's feelings because God's too mighty, but yet he immediately executes you if you just don't believe uh, or tortures you in hellfire with great pain and suffering for all eternity, but yet you didn't hurt his feelings. Strange. And remember when we, or Allah, said, enter this city and eat freely from Wherever you please, enter the gate with humility, saying, Absolve us. We will forgive your sins and multiply the reward for the good doers. That reminds me of the uh, cities of refuge for murderers, but yet 
This is saying that they were good doers, so I'm not exactly sure what it's referring to. But the wrongdoers changed the words they were commanded to say, so we sent down a punishment from the heavens upon them for their rebelliousness. So he's not most merciful and compassionate. If you change words, uh, you get sent a punishment from heaven. Where's the mercy and compassion? Where's the love? There is no love. I think the word love doesn't even appear in the Quran anywhere. It's what I've heard before. We'll see. And remember when Moses prayed for water for his people? We said, or Allah said, strike the rock with your staff. Then 12 springs gushed out and each tribe knew its drinking place. We then said, eat and drink of Allah's provisions and do not go about spreading corruption in the land. So God provided water in the wilderness, just like he did in the Bible. Although I'm not sure there were 12 springs that gushed out of the rock. I don't remember that in the Bible. Verse 61, and remember when you said, O oh Moses, we cannot endure the same meal every day. So just call upon your Lord on our behalf. He will bring forth for us some of what the earth produced of herbs and cucumbers, garlic, lentils, and onions. Moses scolded them. Do you exchange what is better for what is worse? So it sounds like Moses didn't like cucumbers and lentil. He liked manna and quail. Oh. Uh, you can go down to any village and you will find what you have asked for. They were stricken. So apparently, while they were in the wilderness where there are no villages, Moses says, well, why don't you just go into the village? We're, we're camping out here in the wilderness, but all you got to do is walk into town and buy whatever food you want. That's kind of strange. They're supposed to be in the wilderness, not next to villages where they've got all these provisions. They were stricken with disgrace and misery. And they invited the displeasure of Allah for rejecting Allah's signs and unjustly killing the prophets. This is a fair reward for their disobedience and violations. So, fair reward for disobedience and violations uh, from a most merciful and compassionate God. Doesn't make sense. Indeed, the believers, Jews, Christians, and Sabaeans, whoever truly believes in Allah in the last day and does good will have their reward with their Lord, and there will be no fear for them, nor will they grieve. Again, if the Islamic God is true, then when you believe, he should protect them from all harm. But he doesn't, because they endure great harm and fear every day of their life as well. Maybe this is talking about after you die. Uh, everything good's going to happen after you die, which is a baseless claim. There's no evidence. It is a pie-in-the-sky dream with no evidence to support it. And remember when we took a covenant from you and raised the mountain above you, saying, Hold firmly to that scripture which we have given you and, and observe its teaching, so perhaps you will become mindful of Allah. Yet you turned away afterwards. Had it not been for Allah's grace and mercy upon you, you would have certainly been of the losers. So, some people, when they mess up, God shows grace and mercy to keep them from being losers. But some people, he doesn't show grace and mercy, and he allows them to be losers. In fact, we've read earlier that he causes the sickness to uh, grow in the minds of the unbelievers. You were already aware of those of you who broke the Sabbath. We said to them, be disgraced, apes. So this is the first mention of the Sabbath. So it's a, we're just in chapter 2. And so he hasn't even said keep the Sabbath. So he's referring back to the Jews and the Jewish scriptures saying that their law says that they need to keep the Sabbath. But some of them violated it and calls them disgraced apes for some strange reason. So we made their fate an example to, pre to present and future generations and a lesson to the God-fearing. Hmm. We made their fate an example. So in other words, we destroyed them. We caused great problems to happen to people who violate God's laws. And so this is a, an example to all generations that if you mess up, God's going to get you. And that's why you should be God-fearing. You should fear God because he will punish you if you make a mistake. But yet you're supposed to also believe that he's most merciful and most compassionate. 
But if you mess up, you get punished severely. And remember when Moses said to his people, Allah commands you to sacrifice a cow? They replied, are you mocking us? Moses responded, I seek refuge in Allah from acting foolishly. Not real sure about that. They said, call upon your Lord to clarify for us what type of cow it should be. He replied, Allah says the cow should neither be old nor young, but in between. So do as you're commanded. So what kind of cow should the Israelites offer? According to the Quran, neither a young one nor old one, but something in between. It's kind of vague. They said, call upon your Lord to specify for us what color the cow should be. And he replied, Allah says it should be bright yellow cow, pleasant to see. Now, I thought it was supposed to be a red heifer, but in the Quran, it's a bright yellow cow. I don't think the Bible says anything about a bright yellow cow. Uh, wait, I don't think the Bible or the Torah says a bright yellow cow. Again, they said, call upon your Lord so that we may, so that he may make clear to us which cow, for all cows look the same to us. Then Allah willing, we will be guided to the right one. So they're, they're concerned that they might pick the wrong cow because God would kill them or punish them somehow. So we need to get the details straight. It's a bright yellow cow, we know, and it's not young and it's not old, something in between, but we don't want to pick the wrong one. He replied, Allah says it should have been used neither to till the soil nor water the fields, wholesome and without blemish. They said, now you've come with the truth, yet they still slaughtered it hesitantly. So when they finally had enough details to say, well, okay, we can pick a cow now. Uh, it's got to be neither young nor old, but it could have never been used to till the soil or water the fields. And it's got to be bright yellow without blemish Psh, that that should narrow it down pretty good in fact i don't know how you could even find a cow that is neither young or old that has never tilled the soil the whole purpose for a cow is to till the soil so but they were satisfied apparently this is when a man was killed and you disputed who the killer was but allah revealed what you concealed so we've changed subjects off the cow now. So we instructed, strike the dead body with a piece of the cow. Well, here's the cow back. This is how easily Allah brings the dead to life, showing you his signs so that you may understand. So you can hit a dead person with a piece of a cow and they will come back to life. Strike the dead body with a piece of a cow. This is how easily Allah brings the dead back to life. Well, if we could do this today, then I would worship the God of the Quran. If you can hit a dead person with a piece of cow and they come back to life, then I would say, oh my goodness, the Quran is true. If you hit a dead person with a piece of cow and they don't come back to life, that means the Quran is false. Even then, your hearts become hardened like a rock or even harder. For some rocks gush rivers, others split, spilling water, while others are humbled, in awe of Allah, and Allah is never unaware of what you do. He's watching over you like Santa Claus. He knows if you're bad or good. He knows if you believe or not. You can't trick God or Allah. Do you believers still expect them to be true to you? Though a group of them would hear the word of Allah, then knowingly corrupt it after understanding it? When they meet the believers... They say, we believe, but in private they say to each other, will you disclose to the believers the knowledge Allah has revealed to you so that they may use it against you before the Lord? Do you not understand? Do they not know that Allah is aware of what they conceal and what they reveal? So God knows the mind, knows all your secrets, you can't trick him. And among them are the illiterate who know nothing about the scripture except lies, and so they wishfully speculate. Well, I think Muhammad was illiterate. So there have been a lot of people throughout the ages that were illiterate. So woe to those who distort the scripture with their own hands, then say, this is from Allah. 
I think we're talking about the scribes now, people who are writing down, the people who are literate, maybe changing things or manipulating things, seeking a fleeting gain. So they want to maybe improve their own lot in life by saying God said something he didn't say in the scriptures because only a few people are literate. So woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for what they have earned. So what? If people are able to manipulate scriptures and say God said something that he really didn't say, you think God would actually use his mighty power to prevent that from happening. But I guess he doesn't. I know the claim is that God definitely protected uh, the Quran from all manipulation, but yet right here in chapter 2, verse 79, it leaves the door open to the possibility of people being able to change the Holy Scriptures. 279. Now 280. Some of the Jews claim the fire will not touch us except for a number of days. Say, O prophet, have you taken a pledge from Allah? For Allah never breaks his word. Or are you just saying about Allah what you do not know? But no, those who commit evil and are engrossed in sin will be the residents of the fire. They will be there forever. So here in chapter 2, verse 81, we have a promise of eternal hell fire for those who uh, do not believe. Those who commit evil and are engrossed in sin will be the residents of fire. They will live in the fire forever. That's a reference to hell. And those who believe and do good will be the residents of paradise. They will be there forever. So you do good and you got to believe. You got to believe the Quran is the holy word of God and that God, the Allah is the only God and that he's most merciful in all this while he's torturing people for all eternity. So there's your promise of uh, Islamic heaven, which is completely baseless and unsupported. Verse 83, And remember when we took a covenant from the children of Israel, stating, so we being Allah, remember when Allah took the covenant from the children of Israel, stating, Worship none but Allah. Be kind to parents, relatives, orphans, and the needy. Speak kindly to people. Establish prayer and pay alms tax. Make sure you pay your taxes or tithe. But you Israelites turned away except for a few of you and were indifferent. So the Israelites turned away from their God, uh, which is supposed to be the same God as uh, the Muslims. Make sure you pay that money. Give God his money. And remember when we took your covenant that you would neither shed each other's blood nor expel each other from their homes, you gave your pledge and bore witness. But here you are, killing each other and expelling some of your people from their homes, aiding one another in sin and aggression. And when those expelled come to you as captives, you still ransom them, though expelling them was unlawful for you. Do you believe in some of the scripture and reject the rest? Is there any reward for those who do so among you other than disgrace in this worldly life and being subjected to the harshest punishment on the day of judgment? For Allah is never unaware of what you do. So we're not being the merciful Allah now. We're being the God of judgment and wrath. And they want to claim that there's no contradiction there. So he's not most merciful and compassionate if uh, he's subjecting them to the harshest punishment on the day of judgment because they, what? They didn't do what the scripture said. These are the ones who trade the hereafter, or life after death, for the life of this world. So their punishment will not be reduced, nor will they be helped. So those of you or us who say this is our only life, or we focus on uh, you know, what we want to accomplish in this life and not put our hopes and dreams in what's going to happen after we die, which is completely irrational. You know, what do they say? A bird in hand is better than two in a bush. But yet... You are an evil person if you live for the life that you actually have to try to benefit yourself. You're supposed to disregard the life that you have and hope for something better after you die. That's both what Christianity and Islam teaches. Verse 87. Indeed, we gave Moses the book and sent after him successive messengers. 
And we gave Jesus, son of Mary, clear proofs and supported him with the Holy Spirit. So here we're mixing in a little bit of the Christian Trinity doctrine. Why is it that every time a messenger comes to you, Israelites, with something you do not like, you become arrogant, rejecting some and killing others? So I know Islam does not accept Trinity, so they would just consider the Holy Spirit to be another messenger. And actually, that makes more sense uh, than the Trinity anyway. But I have studied and concluded that Jesus did not even exist, which will disprove uh, the Quran and Islam as well. Jesus was a mythical character created by the Romans in response to Jewish rebellions. And I talk about that all the time, so check that out. Oh. Uh, they say our hearts are unreceptive. In fact, Allah has condemned them for their disbelief. They have but little faith. Hmm. Imagine being so mad at people for not believing something because they don't have enough evidence to believe it and then torturing them for all eternity because they said, well, I just didn't see the evidence for what you said was true. Verse 89. I want to try to make it to 100. Uh, although they used to pray for victory, by means of the prophet, over the polytheists, when there came to them a book from Allah which they recognized, confirming the scripture they had in their hands, they rejected it. So may Allah's condemnation be upon the disbelievers. So this would be part of the reason why uh, the Quran would quote from the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, and say, hey, we're the same, we worship the same God that you do. And we're saying that... Uh, that he actually did all this stuff with Moses and Pharaoh and Noah and, and Adam and Eve, that we're, we're just talking the same God, but yet why are you rejecting what we say uh, and saying that it didn't come from God? <clears throat> they think just because they mention Je the book of Genesis and Exodus that the Jews should just throw everything down and say, yep, uh, Islam is the right religion. We'll just switch over to Islam in the Quran, which was created in the 5th or 6th century CE. Verse 90. Miserable is the price they have sold their souls for. So they sold their, the Jews. He's talking about the Jews have sold their souls because they reject Islam and the Quran. Denying Allah's revelation and resenting Allah for granting his grace to whoever he wills of his servants. So, who are you to say that Muhammad was not uh, approved and appointed by God? You know, we quoted your Hebrew scriptures. You should have just believed what we told you. They have earned wrath upon wrath. So just because someone doesn't believe a story that comes later, they have earned wrath upon wrath. This is how you create enemies. This is how you create war. This is how you justify the killing of other people is by saying, by religion, create a religion. It says whoever doesn't accept your religion, they are your enemy. You can dehumanize them and you can kill them in war. And such disbelievers will suffer a humiliating punishment. There's your justification for killing and torturing people in war because they rejected your holy book. These holy books are evil. When it is said to them, believe in what Allah has revealed, they reply, we only believe in what was sent to us. And they deny what came afterwards, though it is the truth confirming their own scriptures. So just because it quotes Genesis and Exodus, uh, although it talks about a bright yellow cow instead of a red heifer, but uh, ask them, O prophet, why then did you kill Allah's prophets before, if you are truly believers? So he's talking about the Jews killing their own prophets. Uh oh. Verse 92, indeed, Moses came to you with clear proofs. Then you worshiped a calf in his absence, acting wrongfully. So the Muslims mocking the Jews for worshiping the golden calf. Jump back there. Uh, verse 93, and when we, or Allah, took your covenant and raised the mountain above you, saying, hold firmly to that scripture which we have given you and obey, they answered, we hear and disobey. The love of the calf was rooted in their hearts because of their disbelief. Say, O prophet, how evil is what your so-called belief prompts you to do if you actually believe in the Torah? So, they're mocking the Jews for worshiping the golden calf. 
which I think is ridiculous. They worship a golden calf too. Verse 94, but it's all mythology. It's all, it's ridiculousness. Say, O prophet, if the eternal home of the hereafter with Allah is exclusively for you Israelites out of all humanity, then wish for death if what you say is true. Now, I make this argument. This is Quran 294. If you think you're going to heaven, then you should wish for death because heaven is supposed to be a place where there's no evil, no bad things that happen, only good things. And, you know, this is really the way a lot of people live their life that they wish for death. But what if this promise of heaven is not real? What if it's just words on a page and it's convincing you to wish for death and there is no hereafter? It's a scam. It's, it's convincing you to wish away your real life and hope for something that you will never get. It's evil. And if you don't recognize this scam, you might actually waste your entire life hoping for something better after you die. And it's just words on a page. Oops, get off of there. But they will never wish for that because of what their hands have done. And Allah has perfect knowledge of the wrongdoers. You will surely find them clinging to life more eagerly than any other people, even more than polytheists. Talking about the Jews clinging to life, even though they supposedly believe in heaven, which I don't really think the Jews believe in heaven. Uh, that's really a Christian and Islamic thing, not really a Jewish thing. Each one of them wishes to live a thousand years, but even if they were to live that long, it would not save them from the punishment, and Allah is all-seeing of what they do. Say, O prophet, whoever is an enemy of Gabriel should know that he revealed this Quran to your heart by Allah's will, confirming what came before it, a guide and good news for the believers." So yeah, it's, it's only good news for the believers, that's right, because whoever doesn't believe gets punished for all eternity. Whoever is an enemy of Allah, his angels, his messengers, Gabriel and Michael, then let them know that Allah is certainly the enemy of disbelievers. So he, Allah is enemy of disbelievers. He's not merciful and compassionate to unbelievers. Indeed, we have sent down to you, O prophet, clear revelations, but none will deny them except the rebellious. So whoever denies whatever these clear revelations are, what, just writing a book that says we quoted Moses and Noah and Adam, and so you should believe, but yet they make claims that the believers, only the believers prosper and all the unbelievers just walk around in, in fear of death all the time? Completely baseless claims. Final verse of this video. Why is it that every time they make a covenant, a group of them cast it aside. In fact, most of them do not believe. All right. See you in the next video.